Okay, we are ready to go. Uh, good, good morning. It's still morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Dennis Normile. I'm a member of the Professional Activities Committee, and I'll be the moderator today. Uh, before we get started, please join me in the usual routine of ensuring that your phones are set to manner mode or turned off entirely so we don't interrupt the, the talk. Uh, it's an honor, frankly, to uh, introduce our guest today, uh, Rico Maranaka. Uh, I'll just give a little bit of the background. <clears throat> when, the, when vaccines became available for the human papillomavirus, they were hailed as a breakthrough innovation in protecting the health of women and girls and men. Uh, they, the vaccines were introduced in Japan in 2010 and made part of the National Immunization Program in 2013 or 2014? 2014. In 2014. Uh, shortly thereafter, there were reports of side effects causing all sorts of uh, strange reactions among the girls getting vaccinated. This got picked up by the media. It became a huge issue, and the government... Uh, stopped recommending that girls get vaccinated. And at that point, Muranaka-san appeared on the scene and was, uh, played a key role in exposing the, the questionable research that there was opposing vac vaccine, vaccination pointed to in support of their claims that it was causing uh, severe side effects in the vaccinees. Uh, partly because of her efforts, uh, last year the government reversed its decision and started recommending vaccination again for appropriate aged girls. And they also launched a catch-up program to vaccinate those women who had missed being vaccinated when they were younger. And uh, Dr. Muranaka is a medical doctor, and uh, she has been recognized for her work in regaining acceptance of the HPV vaccine in Japan. She was recognized with the John Maddox Prize, which is an award given by the Nature Publishing Group uh, for, and I'll read this, this is from the PRIZE website, for courageously advancing public discourse with sound science. The PRIZE recognizes individuals who stand up for science and evidence, advancing public discussion around difficult topics despite challenges or hostility. With that, I'll turn this over to Thank you Rico very much. <laughs> Thank you for your introduction. Um, it's a really pleasure for me to be here today on International Women's Day with good news about Japanese HPV vaccination situation. Especially because the last time I sat here was when I was sued by a doctor who was a theoretical pillar of the anti-vax, HPV anti-vax movement in Japan. And also he was the government appointed researcher on adverse reactions of HPV vaccine and um, the doctor presented in March 20, 2016, very misleading data on TV and said he had observed the damage only with the brain of the mouse vaccinated with the HPV vaccine in a mouse experiment. So everybody thought, oh, the government finally found, also found the evidence of the dangers of this vaccine. However, as I investigated, I discovered it was the result of only one mouse. And I call it a fabrication, and I was sued for defamation, and that's why I came here. So it's seven years ago already, so it's a very old topic, but I'm really glad I'm, I'm here with the good news now. So actually, that time was when I was it was two weeks after that the Japanese government was sued by people who claimed to be injured by the HPV vaccine. It was the first, uh, world first 
class action lawsuit against the government regarding the damages caused by the HV, purportedly caused by the HV vaccine. So when it comes to talk about the HV vaccines, it's always something negative and being angry and <laughs> I never really enjoyed it. But today I have a very great news that in April last year, Japan finally started proactively recommending the HV vaccine again and catching up with the women who had missed a chance to receive it. After eight years and 10 months of temporary suspension, this suspension was in response to unfounded media reports about the adverse reactions of the HV vaccines, such as seizures, chronic pains, truancies, but school remarks, or missed periods or whatsoever, all the, all the things happening to the teenage girls. However, robust data worldwide shows the HIV vaccine is very safe and very effective. The Advanced Reactions Committee of Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare repeatedly concluded that these, these symptoms are psychosomatic or functional disorders. Typically a suit seizure, which is a seizure without abnormality in the brain waves. And these were seen even before the introduction of the HIV vaccine. The Nagoya study, which, is, which was targeting 40, about 40,000 young women living in Nagoya city regarding the 24 symptoms occurring after the HIV vaccination conducted in 2016, that also clearly denied the causal relation between the HIV vaccine and symptoms. So it was proven that also in Japan, the drug injury is not happening. However, the government, sorry, I just forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, however, the government didn't take back the suspension. There are many other momentums that they could have taken the suspension back, but they never did. And they knew the vaccine was safe and they knew the vaccine was safe and effective, of course, but they wanted to avoid confronting the people who claimed to have become vaccine victims. As the government kept on suspending the product's proactive vaccination, people came to believe that even the government was not sure about the safety of this vaccine. As a result, uptake dropped to below 1% and remained at the same level for years. It was about 80% before the suspension. So I think the international coverage of the HV vaccine in Japan lasted until at this point. So, the, so I came here to give updates of what's happening after that. So maybe the first question might be, what happened to the lawsuit against the government and to me? In Japan, lawsuits take a tremendous amount of time. The lawsuit against the government at four district courts in Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, and Fukuoka are still ongoing. In the Tokyo District Court, the statement of opinion, both by the plaintiffs and defendants, are finally over on 9th of April, February, I mean last month, this year. And on the next hearing, planned on 18th of May, Dr. Ikeda, a former professor of neurology of Shinshu University, who sued me for defamation, is testifying on behalf of the plaintiffs as a witness. I'm a bit surprised because he kept on saying he has nothing to do with the class action lawsuit against the government during my, during my uh, lawsuit. And now, anyway, he resigned the professorship and he's, he set up a cl clean clinic in, in Nagano Prefecture and seeing the girls uh, calling themselves victims. So the hearing following that one on 18th of August is for the cross-examination of witness for defendants. So it's still ongoing. So it's been seven years since then already. As for my lawsuit, the Tokyo District Court ruled against me on 
26th of Ma March in 2019 that I had not provided enough evidence of Ikeda's fabrication. Unfortunately, the law didn't question whether it was a fabrication from a scientific view, but questioned the procedure of the interview and the dictionary dis definition of fabrication. Wedge Magazine and I were obliged to pay 3.3 million yen for defamation and publish apologies. While Wedge and its editor-in-chief accept the ruling and agree to pay damages, publish apologies, and delete sections of offending, sections of offending article, I appeal to the higher court independently. However, unfortunately, my appeal was dismissed because the application of claim had terminated since all compensation was paid and apologies were published. This means that Ikeda had nothing more to ask from me, thus I lost the right to appeal. That's what the decision said. And my name was removed from the list of plaintiffs who lost this case in the district court decision. So um, superficially, I am not the one who lost this lawsuit, but I didn't have chance to prove that I was right. Meanwhile, I received the John Maddox Prize from the science magazine Nature and the UK charity Science About Science, About science. and also my mentor and my boss and supporter, Dr. Tasuku Honjo at Kyoto University, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for the discovery of PD-1 and establishing the cancer immunotherapy in 2018. So after winning the Nobel Prize, Dr. Honjo started to give talks about the HV vaccines, I mean, about the importance of cancer prevention by the vaccines together with the latest uh, cancer immunotherapies. He wrote an expert opinion for my lawsuit too, and such small events, I don't know small, but such events made the media hesitant to cover the voices of the people who claim to be vaccine victims. The medical doctors, and many societies felt it became easier <laughs> to recommend the HV vaccine and also to support me openly. Before that, they were so afraid of supporting me or suffering the vaccine because they will be attacked by the people who hate vaccines. Even politicians' leagues were established to lobby for the restart of the proactive vaccination. And students started to lobby for catch-up vaccination and voice vaccination. So um, it's not really, it was not really obvious, but I can say the public attitude toward the HV vaccine has slowly but steadily changed over the years. But um, what made the restart of the recommendation possible was mostly the passage of time. In fact, the only reason that the Advanced Reactions Committee gave in December 2020 for the start of the proactive recommendation was that there seemed to be no more reason to suspend it anymore. So it wasn't really <laughs> explaining anything. But it was also true that they had no specific reason to start the proactive recommendation again. At that point, there were many other momentums that they could have started earlier. Here, I have a few similar results of the similar surveys done by high school students in 2019 or 2020, that um, there are many uh, special classes or seminars happening in many of the high school reading my book called 100,000 Worms, which is a number of the worms that could be lost in Japan by the suspension of the HV vaccine anyway. And according to this survey, most of the eligible younger women don't know the scary videos of seizures anymore, but they also do not know there is a cancer-preventing vaccine and they could receive it for free. On the contrary, most of their parents knew about adverse reactions and the fact cervical cancer is vaccine-preventable. In any case, the restart of recommendation is indeed a big step in the right direction, but issues still remained. 
According to the estimate made by Osaka University in 2020, if no particular action is taken, Japan will have an additional 17,000 cases and 4,000 deaths caused by the suspension of the HIV vaccines. Mostly among young women, the peak age of becoming cervical cancer is from the late 20s to late 40s now in Japan, which matches a childbearing age. That's why cervical cancer is called a mother killer. So we really need to make an effort to minimize the damage and proactively recommend the HIV vaccine. But the question is, was proactively recommending the HIV vaccine and doing the ketchup really enough? So what was the uptake after the restart of pro proactive recommendation? So it's been almost a year by now and the uptake was just announced recently. Sorry, it's in Japanese, but according to the data published by the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare in Japan in January this year, the uptake of the first dose from April to September last year was 30.1%. It's not really bad as I, we expected. We expected it to be around probably 20% at, at most, but it's still far from 80% what we had before the suspension. A poor cervical cancer screening is also an issue. Women who missed the chance to receive the vaccine or who didn't have vaccines when they were teenagers should have screening. In Japan, free cervical cancer screening offered to women over 20 years old every two years. However, most women in Japan have their first screening when they become pregnant. The recent data from Odawara Municipal Hospital showed only 24% of all pregnant women had a screening before they became pregnant. And as more women, Japanese women, choose to be pregnant later in their life, it became difficult to find uh, cervical cancer at the early stage. So unfortunately, many women find pregnancy when they become pregnant. According to the interview by Dr. Tomoaki Ikeda, a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Mie University, the frequency of cervical cancer and precancerous lesion is estimated to be about 1%. And all, pregnancy, all pregnancies in Japan, and many of them have to choose abortion, of course. The dosing schedule is also an issue. While most of the countries had already shifted their schedule from three, three doses to two doses years ago, the WHO Strategic Advisory Board of Experts on Immunization called SAGE revised their recommendation even to one dose based on the data for more than 10 years last April. Japan still recommends three doses according to following to manufacturer's recommendation. So it's a very, um, in, I think it's very important, so I have to say, um, it, one dose is now recommended for all countries, for anyone under 20 now, because uh, they found that the antibody level, I mean, the protection level is the same as one dose, two for the girls vaccinated with one dose and two dose and three doses. So it's a game changer, because actually there is a huge demand of HPV vaccines than uh, supply. So they're talking about one dose schedule, especially in the UK and India is discussing to introduce one dose now. And de in a delay in introducing the nivalent vaccines is an issue too. Under Japan's free immunization program, girls are offered the four valent or two valent old vaccines, which prevents only 60% of the HVB cases responsible for cervical cancer in Japan. Most developed countries have been offering the nine valent vaccine since around 2017. Its introduction to Japan's national immunization program was delayed. And it prevents, but it prevents over 90% of cervical cancer in Japan. 
So, but it was finally approved for self-pay vaccine in 2021 amid the pandemic. So there are many things that Japanese women won back in the past years, but still there are problems. However, lastly, there is good news too. In February this year, I mean last month, the expert committee at the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare of Japan announced that from this April, I mean next month, the nine-valent vaccine will be included in the free immunization program of Japan. So girls can receive the same advantage, same protection as the, the girls in the other countries. And also anyone who received two valent or four valent for the first or the second dose could also receive no valent for their second or third dose. So it has been discussed a long time. This mixed match schedule is okay or not. And it was just approved quite recently. And just yesterday, they announced that the two dose schedule will be introduced to the women who received their first HV vaccine under 15 years old from this April too. So I think I could say almost all the problems of the HV vaccine policies in Japan is now fixed. And we're finally ending the stigma against HV vaccine. It's a great news for us, but maybe it's not the, the headline for the media. But so all we have to do now is to provide the right information within anyone's reach for girls, also for boys, parents, and women for all ages to make the right choice of vaccination and increase the uptake. And the lesson is, it takes a long, long time to recover vaccine confidence once it's lost whatever unreasonable reason it was. So if you see even a small sign of vaccine hesitancy, don't hesitate to fight it back immediately. Misinformation has destroyed public confidence in the HV vaccines and put thousands of women at unnecessary risk of developing cancer. And we actually have started to see an increased number of abnormal pap smears among women in their 20s who haven't received the vaccines at the eligible age. So whenever I hear such news, I have a feeling that honestly, I could have done better. We could have done better. Such a story should not be allowed to happen again with any vaccine anywhere in the world. We have learned enough and look at our COVID-19 vaccine uptake. That is one of the highest in the world. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Murunaka. If I could suggest that perhaps we, we might want to clarify the nine-valent and four-valent vaccines. This is, they need the multivalent vaccines because there are many different strains of the virus. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, HV vaccine has probably over 150 strains, types. And although there are only the specific strains cause is our cancer causing. And right now there are two violent, four violent and nine vaccines existing in this world. And most of the countries switched to two or four violent, two nine violent in around 2017. But because there was a class action lawsuit going on in Japan, the submission and approval process has been suspended for the same time. So there are some movement toward the the restart of proactive recommendation, and they just sort of, and the, after the pandemic, it became sort of difficult to lobby for the suspension, I mean, to keep on suspending and for the, lo for the lobbyist, anti-vaccine lobbyists to come to the ministry and really to say, keep on suspending the vaccine. They actually finally did it quickly um, during the pandemic, and it was approved in 2021. December in 2021 in Japan, but it was only self-pay. So a two-valent vaccine is effective against two strains. Yes. And a nine-valent vaccine is effective against nine strains of the virus. Right, and four-valent is also effective to, for, to two strains causing cervical cancer. So actually the protective level for two-valent and four-valent is same for the cervical cancer. 
But also, the HV vaccine is, there are other cancers caused by HV, HVV2, like um, nasopharyngeal cancer or anal mm. cancer or whatever, uh, mostly for boys and men. So um, these four, the extra two types included in full violent is effective for these cancers. Right. We have, uh, we'll start with one question that came in uh, from an online viewer. This is from uh, Ilgin Yorlmaz of BBC World Turkish. She notes that today is International Women's Day. And she says, according to the economists, <clears throat> excuse me, glass ceiling index, Japan ranks second to the bottom, just one rank above South Korea, among 27 OECD countries in terms of pay gap and the low number of women in politics. So her first question is, are Japanese women unambitious or powerless in pushing for a gender transformative agenda, including taking responsibility for their own health and demanding HPV vaccination? And question two, what do you want to say to the G7 gender equality ministers meeting in Nikko this May? Okay, um, I would not say Japanese women are not ambish, unambitious or powerless <laughs> in pushing for gender transformation, but Especially um, today, there are some university students coming with me today, and they're uh, doing some uh, activities to demand for the uh, catch up can catch up in boys recommendation uh, boys uh, boys vaccination, and they made actually a small video of advocacy. So I just want to show it to you here. Oh, wow. ワクチンで予防のできる唯一の癌です。日本では小6から高1の女子が子宮頸癌ワクチンを定期接種として無料で接種することができます。打ちました。私を守る子宮頸癌ワクチン。命を守る手段がある以上、私は打つべきだと思
uh, Nishioka appeared on Irish TV and said, this vaccine is very dangerous. But the government responded very quickly, and they just stopped, um, increased the, they recovered the vaccine fix so quickly. So we should learn. And um, actually, um, it's very, uh, I have a very um, good feeling that whenever I try to involve more people for um, spreading right information about HIV vaccines, like say five years ago, nobody wanted to do it with me. But I found many friends or many other people who are actually doing it now. So it's a very good positive change in Japan now. All right, just to clarify, um, do, do you have a, an answer for question two? Oh, or sorry. are you going to let the, uh, <laughs> let the young women speak for themselves? Oh, maybe they want to talk. Please. What do you want to say to the G7 Gender Equality Ministers Meeting in Nikko this May? Um, and I was suggesting that maybe the best thing, most effective thing you could do is send them all a link to your video. <laughs> yes, um, that would be great. But also, um, I think... Could you give us your name and... Okay, um, my name is Utako Kawakami, and I am a junior student at the International Christian University, and I'm here because I'm leading a youth action in spreading awareness of the HPV vaccine in Japan. And um, as I think she suggested, I think one of the biggest reasons why HPV vaccine hesitancy um, took so long to recover is because women's health is not that much of a big issue. Um, I think men, um, top men in the government tend to not care too much about um, especially young women's um, health issues. And it, w it took a lot of time to actually bring positive policies. So I really hope that in the future um, also um, also, because Japan has one of the worst birth rates in the world, we really need to work hard on, you know, doing the best to protect women's um, health and women's um, reproductive rights and health rights. And I think recovery of HPV vaccine confidence is a very, very good first step for that. So um, I hope for more positive action um, in Japan as well. Okay, thank you very much. You seem to be very anxious to ask a question. I was, I was wondering why you gave the online, why you uh, gave the online uh, uh, question first and not the room first. Uh, we, we discussed this ahead of time, and she wanted to show the, oh, okay. the video. So that's why we gave her the opportunity to give the video. Would you come up and uh, identify yourself at the, oh. at the microphone? Um, uh, well, they're, they're videographing. Ah, uh, OK. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, this yes, one. they're, they're no. sending this online, so people want to see who's asking the questions. <laughs> Your name and affiliation, please. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm Agnes Handler. I'm uh, here for German Media. I'm also a member of the club. Um, I wanted to thank you very much for your, uh, for your nice talk, um, Dr. Uh, Muranaka, and uh, two questions. Um, why do you think the Japanese government was so reluctant to uh, take on uh, the anti-vaccine voices? And why is there no recommendation for the vaccine for boys, oh. as in other countries? Yes, thank you. Well, one of the reasons why the government was so hesitant was because of the change of the um, vaccine Low, vac low. What do you say? Vaccine low. Um, vaccination low. Vaccination law. Yeah, vaccination law in 1990s. So in that uh, change, that before that change in 1990s, the purpose of the vaccine was to protect the society, and then the purpose of the, uh, the vaccine became protecting individuals. And then, because in 1970s and 80s or so, there are many, many lawsuits about the drug injuries in Japan, and the government lost all of them. And it was very um, interesting because um, the decision said 
the government should be responsible for any symptoms that you cannot definitely uh, deny the causal relationship, although they cannot prove it is what's caused by the vaccine. So any symptom, any damage, any any injury, I don't say any symptom that could happen that happened after the vaccination, regardless of the causality, is. I don't say it's compensated, but they will pay the kind of grief money. I mean, like, com it's not the compensation, but what, how to say? Uh, what is it in Japanese? Mimaikin, um, omimai. Consolation. Yeah, consolation money. So it's a very special system called Kyusai, consolation in Japanese legal system. And after Kyusai system was established in Japan, the government was responsible more for the, the problems caused by the vaccines than responsibi responsibility for not protecting people by vaccination. So they cannot really oblige or strongly recommend vaccination anymore after that. And they can only give opportunities for the people to want to, uh, to, to vaccinate if they want. So it's the same for the COVID vaccine too. We have no obligation for the vaccines. Any vaccine, any free vaccines given in Japan is obligation if they can reject basically. And the boys? And the boys, yes. The boys. Um, for boys, it has been discussed long, uh, again and again, but the uptake of girls is still not enough. So first, first we have to raise, I mean, increase the uptake of the women, um, um, of the girls. And one reason was because the demand of the vaccine is too high, and the manufacturers actually said they cannot provide enough vaccines for all men, all, I mean, boys and girls at the same time. And the manufacturers actually um, probably around in 2021, they say they are not uh, willing to sell vaccines to Japan because they cannot predict the demand here. They are not sure how, much, how many people are <coughs> actually taking this vaccine. So there are some discussions on going on with between the government and the manufacturer. And then I think they agreed to sort of about, agreed about the m amount of the vaccine they provide and they can buy. So, uh, and f I mean, especially nonviolent, and probably uh, the, I think the next step is for vaccination. And that's, that's actually the only issue left in Japan about the HV vaccine now. So everything else was fixed. Other questions? Do you have another question? No? Uh, what is the uptake among, in the catch-up group? Or women who missed the vaccine in their teens, are they getting vaccinated at a significant rate? That's a very good question, actually. And we don't have a number, but the problem is um, most of the women, girls, who have left the place, I mean, they have already moved out from their parents' place. So they're just, well, even the, the government sent a letter of recommendation to the girls when they had their residency at, the, at that time, uh, at the Elizabeth birth. They are not there anymore. So the letters cannot really reach these people. So um, it's actually difficult to find the women who actually meet the, the chance of receiving it. So they're having difficulties. Right, and these letters are sent out by the local ward office? Yeah, lo local government. And in, it includes a, something like a, uh, a coupon to get the vaccine? Yeah. And so the, the local, the local off ward offices cannot, track, cannot be responsible for tracking down these women who have probably moved on to university and to different locations. I think they're not really doing it. Right. They're only sending the letter and coupon to the place where they used to live. So to old addresses. Yeah, old addresses. And some of them are returned. Many of them are. Uh. But of course, these people who have missed a chance have a right to receive the vaccines. So some women who knew they could receive it for free, 
they, they go to the clinic and ask for the vaccination. But um, in all, mo oftentimes, they have to pay by themselves first, and then they get the money back. So it's just a little bit complicated, and <laughs> many women are hesitant to do it. So there's a, a glitch in getting the vaccine to the right, to the, to the women who need it. We are not really actually. So the thing is, many women actually choose to vaccinate nonviolent, especially when they are in the catch-up age or older age, because it has more wider protection. And because everybody know now that nonviolent is more effective than for two violent, there are many girls actually waiting, girls and parents who are actually waiting for the nonviolent to be introduced for the national immunization program. So I. I think and I hope after this April, when the nine valent will become available in a free vaccination program, I think the girls in and I, I think teen, teenage girls could probably the uptake of teenage girls could increase. But I'm not sure about the catch up generation. Right. Yes. Please. the Institute Takeda, associate professional. And uh, I would like to ask you um, two, three things from viewpoint of science, uh, scientific viewpoint. Yeah. And uh, I have no idea when uh, HPV uh, vaccine was developed. However, uh, it took some time, seven years, eight years. And uh, for vaccine, we learned, you know, there are many types of vaccine in case of the coronavirus vaccine. And uh, you talked about this, you know, HPV vaccine. What type of vaccine is, is this in terms of uh, how to make it? So um, not messenger RNA vaccine, I think, have a very similar type of vaccine, I think. Could you uh, make a brief explanation on that? Um, it's an um, inactivated vaccine, classical, but in inactivated. inactivated vaccine but includes only a particle of the um, um, antigen. So you need um, vaccination at least two times or three times. You need um, priming and boost for making an immune memory enough. So um, that's the type of the vaccine developed. Based on the discovery that HPV is actually causing cervical cancer, and this, this discovery won the Nobel Prize in medicine by the German uh, doctor called Harald Schwarzhausen. Yeah. And uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, for this vaccine, uh, there are many scientific researches and development is going on. So could you believe a little bit, you know, you mentioned the two type, four type, nine type, it's a very similar type of vaccine. So is there any um, remarkable movement to make the, a more new vaccine which is safe, which can be com uh, com um, considered safe for everybody. Could you make a brief explanation? This vaccine is proven to be very, very safe already, and one of the safest vaccines in the world and probably in the history. Why? This is why? Because uh, there are many, well, there is a, a huge data of the vaccinated girls in the world worldwide, and um, probably in 2016 announcement, uh, evaluation by WHO, they said probably um, there is a small increase of Guillain-Barre syndrome for probably one out of one million girl. But in the later uh, evaluation for bigger cohort, even that one was denied. And for any vaccine, for any at which, um, whatever age they received, or which vaccine received, or the time, uh, how many times, uh, regardless of how many times they received, it's it's very safe, and mm. there is no uh, adverse reactions uh, actually connected to the vaccine. The nature of the vaccine itself is an inactivated vaccine. Yes. Ah, yeah. Is there any chance to apply messenger RNA vaccine for this matter? I. Don't know, and I don't think there is anything that's going on. So Thank far. you very much. Yeah. Just for the record, I believe the first 
HPV vaccine was put on the market in 2006. Yeah. 2006. And uh, there are now, it's uh, particularly girls are being vaccinated in, uh, I looked at this just before the event, over 140 countries worldwide. And those vaccination programs are being studied extensively. There's a very, very large cohort of women who have gotten the vaccine. And the, the safety record is uh, very solid. Other questions? Um, oh, sure, of course. Yeah, please come to the microphone. Okay, so, hello again. Um, I'm Utako, and I came with um, Dr. Miranaka. I'm a junior university student, and um, so, although there's been a lot of proactive um, policies implemented th these days and a lot of positive action also by the Japanese media, um, it's still true that many people don't, don't know about the HPV vaccine. Even I, a young woman that needed to get vaccinated, didn't know about it until my mother personally told me about it. So I want to ask you, do you think the government and the media is doing enough to spread awareness at this stage? And if not, what should they specifically do, maybe in relation to what they did with the COVID vaccine, which has a very high uptake? And also, on top of that, what can other um, parties do, as such as us students, or maybe schools, or local governments, um, to actually deliver this information to the young girls that need to know it? Thank you. Okay, well, I personally think uh, school vaccination is one of the uh, things that we could do. And while the government says they want to kind of, um, in, they, they want to raise awareness and they want to increase uptake for many, many times, but they're really, really choosing the word very carefully. And even in the pamphlet right now, it says um, this vaccine is offered for free and protective, um, uh, protective for cervical, 90% uh, cervical cancer in Japan, but there are side adverse reactions. So you can carefully read this book booklet and decide whether you really want to vaccinate or not. And this is not the, really, not the wording that they really want to endorse or recommend and to protect girls. I mean, if they really want to say and I mean, the, the way they write is very, still very misleading. And I really need, think they have more clear word that these symptoms that is supposedly, probably, possibly, the adverse reactions have, is nothing to do with these vaccines. That's one thing. And also, I think school vaccination is one uh, way to solve the, pro the, to increase the uptake. Because in the UK, or probably in Australia, I think, they have school vaccination at the age of 13 to 14. And the uptake is about 80% in these countries. And um, they saw the reduction of HPV infection to from like, like 1% or 2% now. So um, they have been a very... Uh, successful introduction of this vaccine, I think we could do it. Because um, long time ago, Japan used to vaccinate influenza vaccine at schools. And that at that time, the uptake was very, very high, like uh, 80%. So we can do the same thing with HIV vaccine, actually. Other questions from the floor? Uh, Dr. Ikeda's research, was that ever published in a scientific journal? Well, that was not published after all, but they kind of, I don't know what they did, but he has been publishing some articles in some, some, some journals. <laughs> because I believe that some of the research results were publicized by uh, the, the anti-vaccine doctors. Uh, some of them did publish, and in some cases, their papers were retracted. Yeah. 
one of but that the, was uh, it was not Dr. Ikeda's work. I think it's not Dr. Ikeda's work, but one of his crew's group, member of the group. Right. If uh, if you have a scientific paper retracted, it means that the underlying research is judged to be uh, the conclusions are judged to be invalid by the scientific community. Um, you talked about vaccine hesitancy, and you noted that the uptake of COVID vaccine was, was very strong. Did the uptake of the COVID vaccine have any impact on the acceptance of the HPV vaccine? I think so. I think um, Japanese doctors, we learned a lot from the HPV vaccine, and Japanese doctors are very, very careful and very quick to respond to the any COVID vaccine hesitancy. Well, of well, the uptake of COVID vaccine is one of the highest in, Japan, in the world in Japan now. It's over 80% for all ages, although the uptake for the younger age is very, children is low. Um, elderly people, it's over 90%. And that's the reason is, um, there are a few reasons, but one of the reasons is doctors responded very quickly to any vaccine hesitancy for COVID vaccine because they did not want to repeat the HV vaccine story. And also I think because of um, the pandemic, people started to realize um, not using the safe and effective vaccine is more dangerous than using the vaccine that could be dangerous. <laughs> so I think um, people came to uh, realize the right uh, yeah, to to appreciate the vaccination before the COVID and also during the COVID. Right. Of course, the impact of getting vaccinated against COVID appears much more quickly than the uh, impact of getting vaccinated for HPV. Yeah, because the cervical cancer could be developed in like 10 years time. Right. And even you're infected with HPV, it's not, you're not, it, most of the times it will just disappear. So people cannot, it's very difficult to appreciate the uh, benefit of this vaccine. <coughs> and then, <coughs> I believe there was uh, <clears throat> one member of the diet, a woman who had, I forget if she had suffered cervical cancer, or, yeah. uh, but she became very outspoken. Did that kind of activity help turn the tide against uh, the anti-HPV anti vaccine movement? Um, there are many uh, interactions between academics academia and politicians. And she was one of the symbol to kind of unite politicians uh, group to lobby for the priority recommendation of the vaccines. And of course, some, and lastly, probably the political pressure made the things different, probably. But behind that, there are a lot of effort by the doctors or medical societies or other people too. Right. And finally, uh, you said that uh, the last remaining challenge is getting vaccinations to giving vaccinations to boys. Uh, do you have any idea when that might be recommended in, in Japan? Pretty soon, I think. Yeah, uh, hopefully in a year or two. Right. Yeah, but they have to do things gradually. Okay. Uh, please use the microphone because we have people watching online. Uh, if you have an idea, could you give me one figure? So how much percentage of uh, this type of the cancer is caused by the hitopapilloma virus? I mean, the cervical cancer, yeah, yeah. almost all. Almost all? Yeah. Almost all. It's proved by the scientific paper or something. Oh, really? Thank you, Ben.
uh, as we noted in the in the announcement that uh, today still every year about 3,000 Japanese women die of cervical cancer and this would be mostly preventable right. yeah okay we've reached the end of our hour I'd like to thank Dr. Muranaka for joining us today and giving us this update. It's a very important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening and coming here today. And thank you all for coming and for your questions. <laughs>